19th century philosophers like Darwin understood little of the cell's incredible inner workings. But contemporary researchers don't have this excuse. Recent research in the field of cell biology has revealed complexity and sophistication completely unrecognized, even just a few years ago. Examination of the cell's genetic code and intracellular dynamics reveals a technology completely beyond the reach of any evolutionary mechanism. Coming up on today's edition of Origins, The Fingerprint of God, with Dr. Kevin Anderson. Hello and welcome to Origins. I'm Ray Heipel. It's an honor to be your host today. During this program, we showcase interesting guests who present evidence from science, along with other important facts, validating the truth of creation and the accuracy of the Bible. Today's guest, Dr. Kevin Anderson, received his PhD in microbiology and was a research fellow at the National Institutes of Health. He has served as a university professor, taught graduate-level molecular biology, directed the research of advanced degree students, and was the director of research for a biotech company. He has also written numerous technical publications and is currently the director of the Van Andel Creation Research Center in Arizona. Welcome to the program, Dr. Anderson. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Well, we're going to be talking about the fingerprint of God. What does that mean? God doesn't have a body. He doesn't have <laughs> fingers. So what are we, what are we looking at? When you have a crime scene and there's a fingerprint, that's evidence that someone's been there. That's evidence that there has been a person that's not maybe visible at the moment, but certainly has left evidence of themselves. So I call this the fingerprint of God in that we may not look and say there's God standing there, but he leaves evidence all over the place that he's been there, that he is active, that he does exist. So the fingerprint of God would be the unmistakable traces or, or evidence, as you say, Correct. that shows this was the work of God. Correct, yes. So we have to recognize that in this day and age, the popular view is that God didn't create. In fact, the growing popular view is that God doesn't even exist. Certainly, the ideas that are taught in universities, taught in our education system, that we see on our televisions and such is going to portray some type of evolution, that things form themselves, that, that, that it's all kind of self-created. And so we recognize those are the popular views. And so when creationists come along, of course, then the reaction we receive is, you know, oh, those dumb creationists, what, what kind of nonsense are they talking now? Mm -hmm. But the challenge I would have to Christians is you got to recognize that we live in a fallen world. So what else would you expect a fallen world to say? Do you think a fallen world is going to say, oh, wow, look at all the evidence? Of course not. A fallen world is not going to say that. A fallen world is always going to react negatively. Man has been attempting to deny his creator almost from the very beginning. So we shouldn't be surprised. And in fact, we should expect that a fallen world is going to react very negatively when we try to talk about a creator. We try to talk about the actions of God. It reminds me of Romans 1 which teaches that man knows God and yet he suppresses that exactly. truth in unrighteousness. It's, of, not a, yes. it's not a head thing so much as a heart thing. It's a thing. heart thing. Mm. And it's never going to be a situation of a popular vote where raise your hand, creation revolution, okay, uh, evolution gets the most hands, therefore it wins. That, that's never how God works. And we have to remember Jesus even said, you know, wide is the gate, many are on it that lead to destruction. So popular ideas are never going to be the, that in itself, mm -hmm. the indication of truth, mm -hmm. in itself, the indication of what is right and what is not right. So we shouldn't worry about what's popular. We shouldn't worry about what is the current fad or what is the, the current idea in a fallen world, mm -hmm. because that's not 
how truth works, and that's certainly not how God's truth works. Yeah, I think we all are aware of having uh, things that we might not like, but it's true and we have to deal with exactly it. Exactly so. So when we look at the ideas of where we came from, the ideas of origins, and we have to recognize when Darwin was proposing his ideas that have become so popularized now. See, he knew nothing about the activities in the cell. He knew nothing about genetics. Mm. He knew nothing about why it is that some people would have blue eyes and some people have brown eyes, some people have you know, blonde hair, some people have red hair. He, he knew nothing about any of that. Ne really, neither did any of his peers. Okay? But because he didn't know anything about that, he used that freedom, if you will, that, that not knowing to make a lot of assumptions. He, made, uh, 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 he just assumed various things. He assumed this would happen. He assumed this would happen. And unfortunately, those assumptions have been carried on for decades and decades and decades. But the thing is, we now live in the 21st century. So it's time to recognize now what is going on, what is happening. All right, so let's look at DNA. All right, the DNA in your chromosomes, in every cell in your body, is a double-stranded molecule. And here we have a very simple illustration of it. All right, you got, you got one strand, and then you have the other strand. And this is something, again, that's in every single cell of a living body. In every cell in your body, you, have, you right. have chromosomes, and these chromosomes contain this DNA. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> when we look at how DNA works, the first thing that was understood was the DNA has what we call a linear code, A, T, C, G. See, here's going to be the A, and there's the C, and there's the T, and there's the G. All right, those stand for adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine, but we just call them A, T, C, G. So, so names for the different parts that yes, we've recognized. Yes, for the, for the different molecules. Mm -hmm. Yes, so in essence, DNA is a four-letter alphabet, A, T, C, G. The sequence of those letters then, just like the sequence of letters in English, determine the information. So the sequence of the letters A, C, T, A, G, A, T, those are different pieces of information because it's different sequences. So this has been understood for quite a while then that the linear code on DNA provides information. And that information is used to dictate to the cell what to do. So each one of those <laughs> letters then tells that molecule what to do. Well, each one the... of those letters represents a piece of information that's mm -hmm. interpreted, just like you reading a page of English. Okay. The letters on that page would be interpreted to have certain meanings. So that's the instruction given. Those are the instructions, mm. exactly. So within the linear code on DNA, why we're going to, like I said, we're going to have letters, A, T, C, G. We're going to have words, which we call codons. We're going to have sentences, which are often called open reading frames. We're going to have punctuations, which would be, for example, stop codons and promoters. And we're going to have paragraphs, which would be referred to as genes. See, so this has been known for years that DNA has this linear code. It's read very similar to how you would read English on a page. And it has a lot of a lot of analogies to the way that you would read English. So we know, you know, rearranging words or replacing words, that's going to change the meaning of a sentence, and you're saying DNA works the same way. Yeah, so let me, let me show you then the thinking that results from that. Okay, because they had this linear idea of DNA, then um, Walter Gilbert in 1992 said, okay, well, because that's the way we see DNA, the size, its organization, then in computer terms, it's actually very little. There's three billion bases sequences, so now there's three billion letters, okay? And you can put all that on a compact disc, a CD. And one will be able to then pull a CD out of your pocket and say, look, here's a human. <laughs> see, so the idea was really simplify it, simplify it, simplify it. A human is just all the, the letters on this CD. That's the total information, they would say, that That's makes the total information, exactly. And, hmm. and with that kind of reasoning, they were able to, to suggest, see, it's not that hard to make a human. So if it's not that hard to make a human, then evolution's really not that difficult either. Just change a few letters. Okay. You now got a, you got a cow instead of a horse, 
and voila, we just can have all kinds of things developing and evolution becomes very, very plausible. So once again, having a little bit of information, it sounds like a lot of assumptions were made. A lot of assumptions were made in part because we didn't know better, but in part because this is what fit evolution. This, this idea really that it's just that simple, it's that clean, well, that makes evolution very plausible. Well, Not that, that difficult. That really is the thing, isn't it? That theory seems to drive more and more what the conclusions have to be, doesn't All it? All too often what we find is that if the conclusion fits what evolution needs, what evolution would like, what, what works for evolution, then that becomes the proper conclusion. If the conclusion doesn't, if it somehow counterdicts, then, well, that's obviously a wrong conclusion. And so all too often we see, right, the ideas of evolution drive the interpretations within science. We have to recognize science is simply an investigative tool. Okay, it's not an oracle handing some truth down from on high. It's an investigative tool. And fallible humans then do the interpretations from this investigative tool. So because we're in the 21st century now, it's time to move beyond this simple thinking. It's time to move beyond what Darwin first proposed and then was proposed later by other people trying to keep it simple, trying to keep it all nice and very linear and straightforward because in actuality, reading DNA is anything but straightforward. It's really very complicated. And we're only now in the last few years beginning to fully appreciate what that means. So we've got to move beyond the linear code and recognize first off, DNA is a three-dimensional molecule. Now, clearly we can only picture it here as two-dimensional, but you gotta recognize that this is three-dimensional. It has a shape, it has a size, it has a length, but in fact, it's read in a four-dimensional dynamic. Okay, what's the fourth dimension? Fourth dimension is time. So what that's telling us is that it's three-dimensional in its organization, in its structure, but that keeps, that shape and structure keeps changing. And when it changes, then, that changes the informational content. So over time, the informational content of a given chromosome changes simply because you're changing its shape. You're changing its, it, how it's, or you're changing how it is being read because the shape constantly keeps changing. Well, that's a lot more complicated than just a flat line of letters. Exactly, um, exactly. You're talking it's, not, about. it's not just simply a linear code. Mm. The linear code is there but the linear code is only part of the code in DNA. For example, there's what's called chromosome kissing. You didn't realize the chromosomes <laughs> flirted with each other. Well, yes. we have fingerprints, yes. now we have kissing. Yes, I mean exactly. But in chromosome kissing, what will happen is within the same chromosome, for example, pieces of DNA may bend around and interconnect or pieces from two different chromosomes bend around and interconnect. And in doing that, what'll happen is some of the information from one chromosome is needed to fully read the information of another chromosome. So this is anything but linear. This requires that three dimensionality. And again, you see that four dimension comes in because it's gonna change over time. Now this interaction is something the body needs, is that? Very, very much so, yes. Many genes and much genetic activity requires this type of interaction between the chromosomes. So if this isn't happening, we're not functioning properly. Correct, hmm. correct. Okay, here's a quote then that was written uh, in journal Nature Review Genetics in 2007. It says, these observations, and these observations refer to a wide variety of these types of events that we've just alluded to, we've you know, just simply referred to. Okay, these observations suggest that genomic architecture is not collinear. Okay, it's not just that linear code, but it instead is interweaved and modular. In other words, it's got all this internal dynamic going on. You have this shape that's so important. You have the interaction where it's bending and twisting and turning that's so important. So that genomic architecture, that's referring to the DNA. That's referring to the shape and to the bending and the twisting of the DNA. And that the same genomic sequences are multifunctional. Now think of that. If you have a printed page there's really only one function, right? You read it left, right, top to bottom, and you're done. And it has one piece of information to it. But in DNA, we're not done yet 
because those letters and those words now can have different functions, have different informational content depending on how you read it, depending on how you bend the page, depending on how you hold the page. See, so you see how we're moving past that linear code that was so often assumed that it's all DNA was. So even if they could see the information, they weren't seeing all the different ways it's used and, and, and gives information. They just saw sort of this linear and they thought that's all that's correct, there. Correct, correct. Because hmm. we recognize these letters are analogous to letters on a page, that's information. Therefore, we got kind of stuck in that mindset. We saw it the way we do things exactly. rather than what exactly. God was doing in the cell. And we thought that was the full answer mm. without recognizing, okay, that's just the first part of the information content wow. in the chromosomes. Isn't it interesting? I'm sure you see this all the time. You know, as soon as you think you've got it figured out and you dig deeper and there's another layer and there's there another is. layer. Yeah. And now we enter into something even beyond that. It's called epigenetics. Epigenetics is where you can impart changes physically, called phenotypic changes. In other words, you can change the, the fur color, you can change the eye color, you can change the, the shape maybe of the jaw, change the shape of a leg, for example. You can may have all these anatomical changes, these physical changes, without altering the DNA sequence at all. Epigenetics involves, for example, putting little methyl groups that's a type of molecule, onto the DNA. And where those are put, that causes those strands of DNA to be read differently. So if, again, you think about it in, as analogy of English, it'd be like if you have a sentence written in English, but then you put little marks on top of the letters, and suddenly those letters have a different meaning. And what is, what is doing that in the cell? Is that something that the cell does itself? That's something or? the cell does itself, right, because it's programmed to do that. How you would evolve epigenetics is still yet to be understood because that's just, it, it is beyond what I would call the ability of evolution to produce. How are you going to not only evolve something that is the linear sequence, but then something that's that three-dimensional information code? So with all these different kinds of uh, functions going on, for lack of a better word, within the cell, um, and, and the evolutionists needing to get it seek, you know, step by step, would it be possible to maybe just begin with the linear and then and the cell could function for a few million years and then go to the next dimension and the next? What would happen in that picture? That would clearly be the way that they would want to address it. Let's start out with very, very simple and then supposedly evolve these more complicated uh, systems later on. But again, see, that's just speculation. What, what's going to be the simple and yet still function? What's going to be the intermediate steps to where we are today? That's just all speculation because there isn't anything that really is functional that is at these intermediate lesser stages. So, so, so if you would take away some of these more complicated steps in the cell, maybe just did the linear, what, what would that look like? I mean, what would happen to the cell? Would it be able to live or function? I wouldn't think so. No, I wouldn't think so. I don't, I don't even think bacteria could function even without some of these more advanced levels of information in the cell. So unless all of these interactions are happening basically from the get-go, the cell's not going to be able to do what it that, does. That certainly is what the current understanding of genetics would tell us. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that we would see to say, oh, this is a very simple beginning stage we could start from. No, we don't have that. Well, let's hold on to that thought. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back after these messages. Stay with us. Welcome back to Origins. We're talking with Dr. Kevin Anderson, who's been sharing about the fingerprint of God. Kevin, if you could remind our audience, what does that mean again, the fingerprint of God? What it means is that God has left indelible evidence of himself in his creation, even down to the cellular level and the molecule level, where really we're the first generation to begin to see some of these very, very specific fingerprints God has left 
in his creation because it requires getting down into the DNA level and down into the molecule level. The psalmist wrote that the heavens declare the glory of God and man has yes. always been able to yes. see that. But now, yes. as you said, for the first time with mm -hmm. our powerful microscopes, mm -hmm. We're seeing that the cell declares yes. the glory of God. And in fact, to finish that quote, it says there's nowhere that it's not heard mm. the glory of God. And I would say that includes the scientific laboratory. Mm. So you don't get away from it simply by saying, well, I'm in the lab now and therefore God's not there. God is there more than ever. And you see those, those traces, those signs of His absolutely. presence. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm. There's a 2014 quote, I think, that really summarizes what we've said so far, and that is that while the standard view, and that would be the standard view of the linear code, the basic understanding of genetics and such, while the standard view has always been an oversimplified model that did not account for a multitude of other processes that are occurring in the cell, its limitations are today more dramatically apparent than ever. It has become clear that the overall picture is much more complex. In fact, I would challenge, have you ever heard of anything in biology becoming less complex? <laughs> See, it just doesn't happen. Every time we make a new discovery, we recognize, oh, this is even more complex than we thought. This is even more sophisticated than we thought. So it just keeps getting more and more and more evidence of design and not anything that's consistent with, that is somehow self-organized. That, that, that if it was simple, then maybe you could say, well, things just randomly came together. But we know, we know from life yes. that things yes. that are complex don't just randomly happen. We have to understand that the first ideas of evolution that were developed even back in the, in the 18th century were based on ignorance. They didn't know. They just simply didn't understand what was going on biologically. And those ideas took hold in a vacuum of unknowledge, in a vacuum of not knowing. Mm. So they, they knew were, there was yeah. a cell, right? But they didn't know anything they about didn't know anything the cell. They didn't know anything about it. They assumed it was very simple. We're in the 21st century now. They may have had a slight excuse because they simply didn't know. But we don't have that excuse anymore. And my challenge to my fellow scientists is get in the 21st century. Mm. What we're looking at when we look at the cell is a structural technology that's unrivaled by human engineering. We don't know how to duplicate a lot of these things. We don't know how to put these things together, and yet there they are. So we're beginning to understand, and we're seeing all this stuff happening, but we couldn't recreate it. We cannot, mm. correct. As a very simple example, in your cells you have little proteins that walk along carrying molecules from one part of the cell to the other. See, if I want to get a molecule from one area to the cell to another, I just don't let it float free. I actually, in the cell, I actually carry it. And these little walkers walk along a protein molecule carrying, they're, they're kind of a male system, carrying these mm. molecules from one part of the cell to the other. But what's also fascinating is these molecules have address labels on them. So the little walker knows I need to go this way, not this way. We don't know how that works. So according like the picture that we're looking at now, that we might want they to picture would, other yeah, roads going would, on. Right, they would be walking along. And yeah, they're going to come to an, to an intersection. They know I need to go this way or I need to go this wow. way based on the addressing, the chemical addressing on the molecules they're carrying. Well, that can't happen by accident. You can't. We wouldn't even know how to design that. And yet they're going to say, well, this just somehow formed itself. It's self-organized. And continues to just work that yes, way somehow, yes. some way. Wow. Richard Dawkins, probably the single most famous atheist sure, in the world today. Yes. In 2006 in Time magazine, he said, okay, if there is a God, he's going to be a whole lot bigger and a whole lot more incomprehensible than anything than any theologian of any religion has ever proposed. Has he even read theology to say something like that? Has, has he not heard of the incomprehensibility of God well, that we talk about? That's the whole point, I would say, is that what he said is completely spot on. Mm -hmm. But see, the irony is Dawkins said this as a criticism. Well, God's just too complex. And yet when we look in nature, we recognize there has to be a complex God because only a complex God could design the complexity we see in nature. Hence God's fingerprint because there's no other explanation than God's fingerprint. So, so to what Dawkins said, I say, yeah, exactly. You're right. You just don't understand why you're right. Oh, amen. You know, it's funny that the theologians for years talk about and how we can't know the, you know, the, the unknown God. Even Martin Luther talked about there's so much of God that man in his finite mind yes. can't comprehend. And what 
Dawkins is saying is that we're seeing so much complexity in the cell that even God would have to be more complicated than what Dawkins thinks that, that, that would be possible. There can't be a God that po it can't be a God that incomprehensible, and yet only an incomprehensible God would account for and be worthy of our worship. Well, what a wonderful point to close the show on. Let me let me just thank you again for being on the program. My pleasure. And I my hope pleasure. you'll be able to be with us again sometime. Be my pleasure. In formulating his theory, Charles Darwin thought that the cell was very simple and that the smaller that we go, as it were, the more simple things would be. Science has shown us that it's exactly the opposite, that the smaller we go with our microscopes as we're looking into the, the very, very tiny, it is more complicated, more complicated. And what we're seeing is that that can't happen by accident, that that level of complexity and sophistication and design had to be the mark of a designer. And that's what we saw today in this program. The fingerprint of God is all over creation. It's even at the tiniest level. It just goes to show you that we know what the Bible says is true. And the proof is all around you, even at the microscopic level. Thanks for joining us for this edition of Origins, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. For a DVD of this program, you can order online or send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins, program number 2006, Cornerstone Network, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. This presentation was made possible by the faithful prayers and financial support of you, our Cornerstone family.